Hello everyone, um, welcome to the third and final session of um, the first day of this workshop. Our first speaker today will be Johannes Friedrich. Um, Johannes received his first degree in physics at the University of Würzburg in Germany. He then moved on to the Department of Physiology at the University of Bern in Switzerland, uh, where he did his PhD in uh, 2012 uh, with Walter Zen, I think. He then moved on to postdocs at the University of Cambridge and Columbia University before he joined the Flatiron Institute as an associate research scientist. So um, I look forward to his talk. Um, um, welcome, Johannes. Uh, thanks, Ivo, for the kind introduction. Thanks for the organizers for kind of inviting me to kind of uh, present some of our most recent work, uh, which is on online methods for real-time analysis of calcium imaging data. Uh, so why would one consider online processing? Uh, well, one aspect is that data sets uh, grow larger and larger, like experimentalists record uh, for longer and longer times and a larger field of views so the data sets might be too big to fit into memory so if we kind of process them uh, online in a streaming mode that drastically reduces the memory requirements and a second reason for online processing maybe more exciting is that in, it enables a new closed loop experiments where we can kind of perform imaging do the analysis online in real time and based on this analysis perform uh, for example, optogenetic uh, stimulation uh, to to kind of uh, actively like do causal uh, interrogations of the neural circuits and not just uh, observational studies. So that's kind of very very powerful strategy that has kind of been used uh, recently, maybe since four or five years for two photon imaging data, and uh, more recently it has also been uh, possible to use this technique of both performing optogenetic activation as well as calcium imaging uh, at the same time using this miniaturized microscopes, uh, which can then be used with free moving animals. So here on the right, you see kind of the mouse uh, heavily moving around, but it's on the left, to see the GFP uh, recordings. And there are some neurons which are, uh, uh, which are, uh, are marked with red contours, which are kind of optogenetically stimulated whenever the red, uh, red square appears here. Okay, so it's kind of very exciting that like on the side of, of uh, the optical side, the methods are there to kind of pursue so, such closed loop experiments. So there's also kind of need to kind of develop algorithms for accurate and efficient extraction of, of the calcium signals and the un underlying neural activity. I, I repeat some of the standard like offline processing pipeline and then move on towards online processing. So the typical pipeline is that we kind of record a movie, do some motion correction, and then source separation and deconvolution. I won't talk much about motion correction, but there are various methods out there to perform rigid or non-rigid motion correction. And for source separation, the uh, the dominating uh, method that's kind of most widely used, I would say, is uh, some form of constraint non-negative matrix factorization, where we have the movie, which is kind of denoted as M, which can be expressed as a product of two matrices, A and C, where the matrix A are basically here, so this kind of as a uh, the spatial footprints of each neuron. So that's kind of will be our sparse matrix in the uh, since the neurons are, are spatially localized, and the matrix C, which uh, are the, the time series of each component. So that would be the, the red and the blue curve in this example. Then we have some background signal, which in the case of fo fo uh, two photon data can be well modeled as a low rank matrix. For, so here example, it's a, a rank one matrix where we have some, some spatial uh, component shown here. Uh, the neural pulse signal and the uh, activity in time. Okay. And of course, we have some noise, which is here the, the capital E. So the, the mathematical objective is then basically you find A, B, e, and C that kind of minimize this kind of Frobenius norm, subject to some constraints 
one constraint being that the neurons are localized, so the matrix A is sparse. And we also have some constraints given by, by the calcium dynamics. Uh, as already mentioned, for two photon data, we can model the background as a low rank matrix. This model turned out to be not expressive enough for the micro endoscopic one photon data. Um, so Peng Cheng Su basically came up with a, uh, with a different background model, an autoregressive background model, which makes use of the fact that uh, the background sources are spatially more coarse than the typical size of a neuron. So the idea is that we model the background uh, at one pixel as a linear combination of the background for sense values of pixels that are nearby, uh, specifically say are on a ring, but this, they are nearby, but not nearest neighbors. So typically the ring size is kind of chosen to be like 1.5 to two times the size of, uh, or the radius of a neuron to kind of avoid uh, contributions of the underlying neuron. And this model, it's, it's, it's more complex and more expensive to model, but it has been, been a very effective and is, is now widely used to kind of pro process uh, miniscope data. And for deconvolution, um, a, a very fast method is to perform sparse non-negative deconvolution, which was suggested by Fugelstein already back in 2010, where we say calcium dynamics is well modeled as an R2 process, or uh, actually an RP process is P typically being one or two. Uh, in the figure, you see an example from this like a uh, generative model uh, where we have the spike train S and then the calcium C basically the spike train uh, convolved with some response kernel. And of course, we can observe it only up to some noise. So the noisy data points would be the Y. So we have this constraints given by the calcium dynamics. And of course, spikes are non-negative. So we have the first non-negativity constraint. And then basically minimize some residual sum of squares plus some sparsity penalty subject to the constraints given by the calcium dynamics. Okay. And that's, uh, it's a convex problem. So what we did in the past was to just use an off-the-shelf uh, convex solver, which turned out to be not sufficient for online processing, which uh, I will describe uh, describe in, in one of the upcoming slides. So for online processing, we basically start only with a, a small initial batch and use uh, constraint non-negative non -negative matrix factorization to in initialize the algorithm. And afterwards, we kind of proceed frame by frame. So we kind of read the frame, kind of motion correct it. We process it by like demixing overlapping components. Then we denoise and deconvolve the temporal traces. And if the initial batch size was too small, we won't detect all neurons in the initial batch. So we need some method to kind of detect new neurons that become active only later during the uh, succession. And with more and more data, we also might want to kind of update these shapes and background to get a better, better estimates. Uh, so the image very roughly kind of illustrates this, uh, this method where initially we have only very few neurons active and, and detected by the algorithm. And it's more and more recorded frames, more and more neurons become active and are, are added. Okay. Uh, for motion correction, I only say that like if you kind of, if you perform online processing, the nice thing is that we basically get a nice template for free and that's a previously denoised frame, which is basically the background plus A times C, which is the neural contributions. And we kind of register the current frame to this template. For demixing, uh, previously, I, I showed that the entire movie can be expressed as a product of a matrix A times a matrix C plus a background. So if you kind of consider not the entire movie, but just the frame, we basically have this expression so for the current frame M, which is in this case a, a vector. So we obtain the non-denoised activity Y by simply solving a least best problem. Uh, so this Y gives us basically this non-denoised activity here, this, this noisy Y. And this activity is then further denoised and deconvolved um, by performing this sparse non-negative deconvolution. Uh, to kind of perform that online, we 
managed to come up with a new algorithm, it's kind of called OASIS because it's an online active set method for inferring spikes, which is, it's like two to three orders of magnitude faster than the previous methods that we kind of that we used, that were kind of the, the fastest methods out there. And the nice thing is that it kind of processes through the data sequentially from the beginning to the end. So in the animation, you kind of see the, the blue crosses show which, which data points are currently touched and, and updated. And the most right uh, cross really moves, moves to the right frame by frame. Okay? And the algorithm basically roughly proceeds is it starts with the unconstrained solution and then mo it moves through the time series and makes sure that this, this constraint uh, is, is satisfied. And while it moves to the right, it only kind of backtracks to the most uh, most recent spike. So we uh, we don't this we don't touch these uh, anymore once they kind of uh, beyond the most recent spike. Okay. So that that was one thing that was kind of crucial to kind of achieve real time performance. Um, now, toward detecting new neurons, in order to do so, we keep a buffer of. Uh, the last, say, 100 instances of the residual. So the residual being the, the raw movie frame minus the neural contributions minus the background. Um, and in this residual, if there is kind of still activities that's not explained yet, uh, we might want to need to capture this by adding a new component. So we kind of look for, for the, we look at the variance, for example, and look for um, the, the maximum. And then we can perform a uh, local rank one in MF to get the spatial footprint A nu for the candidate component and C nu, the, the time series. And then we ca the candidate component is screened for quality. So if it is an actual neuron, the time series should look like a calcium trace. So there should be some high SNR events. So we can look, uh, put a threshold on, on the observed SNR value. And if it's above the threshold, um, we accept the, the candidate component if it all, if also the shape looks like a, a neuron. And in order to kind of classify whether a neuron looks, whether a candidate component looks like a neuron, we uh, try, had to use some label data and train a convolutional neural network to do so. And here, that's kind of basically the detection of new neurons in action. So in the top left, you see the raw data. Uh, below, you kind of see this residual buffer that we keep track of. So these are these, these uh, the variants of kind of the last 100 frames. And if there is if there is a bright spot in the residual, we check whether there is a, a, a component that looks like a neuron. Whenever there is a pink square popping up, uh, then a new component is kind of added. So the, in, to the top right, you see the inferred activity of all the neurons detected so far. And below the denoise data, we see the inferred activity plus all those, uh, the background signal. Uh, so that's kind of mesoscope data from, from the Tolia's lab. And in order to update the shapes and the background, um, sorry, it's a bit of a messy slide. But in, in general, we, we, uh, in the offline version or batch version, one would obtain the neural shapes by solving this non-negatively squares problems and the background weights W by solving the least squares problem, which subtract to the, the ring constraint. In the online setting, of course, we don't want to keep track of the entire movie up to, up to the current frame, but instead we keep only in, track, um, in memory some sufficient statistics so instead of kind of keeping in memory the entire movie, we only keep track of, for example, the product of the matrix of the movie times C transpose, C being the, the temporal matrix. And these sufficient statistics can be incrementally updated. For here, for example, for CC transpose, we get the old value of CC transpose and just add uh, the value for the current frame. And for the the matrix A as well as W are sparse, so we kind of uh, can exploit sparsity to kind of uh, have like an efficient efficient algorithm. Further, the neural shapes as well as the backgrounds, of course, 
change very slowly, if at all. So updating A and W is not required at every time point. In practice, we update them, for example, every 200 frames. And in the, in the case of for two photon data, we also manage to kind of basically balance the workload. So instead of updating all neurons at the same time, uh, let's say if you have like 400 neurons, instead of updating 400 neurons every 200 frames, you can just update like two neurons at every frame. Uh, and so uh, basically have a, a balanced workload so that every frame is kind of processed uh, in, in real time. And we don't have like outliers uh, that take a, a long time to kind of process. Okay, so that's roughly kind of the, the, the algorithm in a, in a in an overview, I kind of present some results. So there are kind of results, but two photon image chains, these are already, already published. In the top row, you see the results for, for the offline method, or it's kind of here denoted as Kaiman batch. And in the bottom row for the online method, uh, here we kind of had some ground truth data in the form of like consensus data of, of labelers. So here it was labeled by three annotators uh, since then like they differed between each other, but afterwards they kind of discussed and came up with some consensus. And as you can see, the, both the batch method as well as the online method agree very well um, with uh, labelers and uh, comparing the top row with top left with the bottom left, the offline and the online method should kind of quite similar uh, results. So the detecting components are similar. The same holds true for the extracted shapes that are kind of shown here to the left. So CA is a consensus annotation. C is an online method and the offline batch method. And also the extracted temporal traces are, are highly correlated and look, look visually indistinguishable. There's a processing time that's for data that uh, that's kind of close to the typical 512 by 512 at, at 30 hertz. Um, it was like uh, 41,000 frames. And as, as you can see, the typical processing time for one frame is around maybe a bit over uh, around 20 milliseconds. And none of the frames took longer than 30 milliseconds to, to process. So for two photon data, we kind of manage to kind of process every frame in, in real time. So that's, that's great. Um, more recently, we kind of try to extend this work, uh, this online methods to, for two photon data to also process microendoscopic one photon data. So here's the date, some data set from uh, Dorsal's triadum from the Sabatini lab. And as you can see in the top left, the, the raw data, you have like much larger background fluctuations, uh, so background kind of almost kind of overwhelms everything. It's kind of hard to identify uh, individual, uh, individual neurons. Um, and we basically have to kind of use this more complicated uh, background model to kind of capture, capture the background. Here's the detected components for the offline and uh, the online method we kind of developed. And I mean, the take home message is very, they kind of both extract very similar components. Most of them are detected by, by both algorithms. And there might be like a few false positives and false negative uh, for each method, uh, but overall both do kind of very well. Uh, same holds for the extracted traces, they're kind of highly correlated. So here I show some traces that are kind of ranked uh, by uh, by the correlation uh, with each other. Here's a, the computing resources for processing the data. So the data that consisted of like 6,000 frames at 10 hertz. So uh, the recording time was 10 minutes. And for processing the entire data set, it takes about seven minutes. So we kind of at least kind of faster, at least on average. If you kind of look at the time per frame just for processing, um, which is a demixing and deconvolving um, the activity, so it's like this kind of scales linearly with the number of neurons. 
So it's on, it's, it doesn't explicitly depend on the number of frames, only kind of implicitly, of course, with like a more number of frames, more neurons are detected. And in panel C, you see there's a peak memory where there's a processing time. Um, so the, the orange and the blue dot are using an, an offline method. Uh, so the, the orange, the blue one is without splitting. So they reprocess the entire field of view at once. Whereas uh, the orange one basically splits the entire field of view into smaller patches and processes these uh, in, in parallel. And in, uh, in red and green, that's kind of the time in the memory for the online method using like two different summary images, uh, summary images uh, to kind of detect new components. But yeah, both of them are kind of very similar. As that was, is a, was performed on on a laptop, um, and it's really on a laptop. Like the online method, kind of is really preferable over the offline method since it's kind of its memory resources are much lower, and it's even faster. In panel D, I performed the kind of same analysis, but like on a on a big like desktop with like plenty of memory, and there we could basically split split the entire field of view into like 16 smaller patches and process them all in parallel. So that's kind of a really fast offline method, but it requires like almost 50 gigabytes of RAM, um, whereas the online method requires only around or in the order of like one gigabyte. Okay. So especially if, you, if computational resources are limited, uh, might be a good uh, choice to kind of use the online method instead of the offline method. And finally, I want to kind of uh, look a bit more into detail into like real time processing. And here are kind of basically three approaches how one could perform real time processing. So the first one is to just perform tracking. So that's how what's, I guess, cu currently mostly done in, in real time experiments. Um, so that you kind of have a, a user long enough initial batch to kind of identify all regions of interest. And then during real-time processing, we basically only need to read the frame, motion correct it, and process it by demixing overlapping components and denoising and deconvolving the temporal traces to get the activity at uh, at each at the current frame. Okay. And the timing is kind of shown in panel B. As you can see, we kind of here it's about like 15 milliseconds per frame on average. As the data was recorded at, at 10 hertz, so like it actually would have like 100 milliseconds available to to process the frame. Um, so that's that's one way to perform uh, return processing. Another way would be could kind of just use on AZE, so that basically the algorithm I kind of presented previously for the online algorithm for microendoscopic one photon data, where we only use a smaller initial batch. And then we perform the same steps as in tracking, but additionally need to kind of detect new neurons and perform updates of the shapes and the background. And these updates of the shapes and the background um, is quite expensive. And for the one photon data, it cannot be well distributed or like the workload cannot be well distributed over all frames. So what we end up is like that every say 200 frames um, it we have like this high as we lack uh, have a lag in real time processing. So that's kind of shown here in the, like you see the, the gray shaded area which kind of denotes the frames that are processed in real time. And you see so, like this periodic pattern where every two hundred frames we kind of lose for a few frames a real time performance. So. Uh, in this case, 81% of the frames were kind of processed in real time. To kind of avoid this, um, we came up with a, a different background model, which uses a convolutional neural network and applies it to the to the raw data to kind of remove the background. And once the background is kind of removed, we can just use it on AZ, like the standard uh, algorithm that we kind of use also for two-fold in processing. And that kind of allows basically to kind of distribute this update of the shapes over all frames instead of having like some frames where a lot of computation is, is performed. And then we basically also it enables to process all frames uh, in return. 
Okay. And the last slide, or the last result slide, to illustrate that basically all these three approaches achieve similar results if it comes to the uh, detected components, Shikani, Shon, and Panel E, uh, as well with regard to the, the temporal traces, which we kind of shown in, in Panel G. Um, tracking and on AZE uses set exactly the same background model, so it's like not too surprising that uh, the results for, the, for them are a bit more similar than the ring scene. And we kind of applied both to kind of simulated data to kind of compare the ground truth, both methods uh, did kind of good, uh, good results. So to wrap up, uh, I presented a, a method for the online analysis of calcium imaging data. It's an automated pipeline that can discover and track the activity of hundreds of cells. It facilitates closely behavioral experiments, makes real-time processing feasible. It's memory efficient, so it's also interesting to kind of process already recorded data. Um, and the performance is, is about on par with, with batch processing. And more recently, we kind of extended on AZ uh, to also handle microendoscopic one photon data. So that's kind of the part that's not, not published yet. Uh, so we presented on AZE, which is an, an online adaptation of the CNMFE algorithm. So the CNMFE algorithm is the algorithm that uses the string background model uh, as an extension to CNMF. And uh, our new contribution was to kind of introduce a ring convolutional neural network, which allows even faster processing. The results I presented were all done on a laptop. If you have like a, a machine with a GPU, that's kind of certainly helpful if you kind of use the convolutional neural net. Um, since work was kind of done within Flatiron Institute, uh, together with uh, Evdigio Snevmanikakis, and uh, Andrea, Andrea Chiovanucci, who kind of now moved uh, moved on to UNC. And uh, so these are the two colleagues who kind of mostly involved with the work. Uh, within the Flatiron Institute, Pat Garn and Dmitry Klofsky are also kind of involved with the project. And some of the early work uh, were, were done together with Liam Paninsky and Peng Cheng Su at uh, Columbia University. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. I'm kind of happy to take questions. Uh, I guess I kind of quit sharing the screen. Yeah, thank you very much, Johannes, for your very nice talk. Um, oh, yeah. I um, have two questions from the audience. Um, so I will read the first one from uh, Rong Chen. So that's something that you have partially probably already answered in your talk, but um, I would like to ask the question anyway. So Rong Chen asks, what is the challenge of one photon data relative to two photon data and how do you need to tune the parameters? Well, the challenge is basically that the background is more complicated. Like as you kind of saw in the, in the dorsal three atom data that I was kind of presenting, uh, you often have like blood vessels and uh, the background is, is, not, is not my well model with this low rank uh, background models that we kind of use for two photon or light sheet imaging data, which is mostly due to like uh, out of focus light sources. So you kind of get like local uh, contributions of this, uh, of yeah, out of focus light. So in order to kind of model that, uh, it turned out that we kind of needed a more, more complicated uh, background model uh, was kind of necessary. Yeah, thank you very much. Um there are two more questions, um, both from um, Carlos Vivarios. So the first one is, um, how compatible is this approach for dendritic voltage imaging? Can it be adapted to detect dynamical regions of interest? But dendritic and voltage imaging, that's good. Yeah, so. Um, yeah. So for. Asked, uh, um, yeah, that's a good. That's an interesting question. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so then, dendritic data is always kind of a bit more, more, more challenging. Uh, still, like kind of to kind of detect the the, the individual neurons, uh, and there we actually kind of use more like uh, we more directly start actually with, with in the offline approach we start more directly with is just using a non-negative matrix factorization. I haven't yet tried to kind of use the online method on on dendritic data. 
but yeah, that, that, that's only kind of an interesting aspect for future work. Um, for voltage imaging data, I, I mean, we extended some of the methods to kind of voltage imaging data where you, you tr your, the transients are much, much lower than the calcium transients. And there it kind of turned out that it's very, uh, that it's very necessary to kind of really perform the denoising step. Like if you don't denoise your traces, most uh, that the denoising will very will make sure that uh, that the traces were, or the parts of the trace where there is only noise are actually kind of set to zero. If you don't do denoising, you don't extract good good shapes mm -hmm. and good uh, uh, a good time series. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for your great talk and um, answering questions. I will now um, invite on stage um, our next speaker, Simon Schulz. Um, let me start introducing Simon Schulz uh, while he um, comes um, online. So um, Simon Schulz um, got his first degrees at Monash University in um, the electrical in, and computer systems engineering department. And he also got uh, another first degree in physics. So um, he studied in Melbourne, Australia. He then uh, went to Oxford and um, in Oxford, he did a PhD with Edmund Rolls. He worked um, as a postdoc with uh, Tony Moffshan at uh, New York University and then returned to the UK for a postdoc with uh, Michael Heuser at UCL. And um, since 2004, he is the head of uh, the Neural Coding Laboratory in the Department of Bioengineering at Imperial College. And um, he is also a professor of neurotechnology there. So um, I look forward to uh, Simon's talk. Thank you for the uh, invitation to, to speak. Um, I'm going to be following on uh, from the lines of the, of the last uh, talk, which is on uh, obviously imaging uh, calcium signals in populations of neurons. And we're going to be talking about uh, an application of this um, to monitoring hippocampal neurons during behavior. Um, and we're aiming this particularly at mouse models of neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, I'll mostly be showing you data from wild type mice. Um, uh, we would probably have, uh, have data to show from uh, Al Alzheimer's mouse models uh, if it hadn't been for uh, a few delays due to the COVID uh, closures. Um, so um, around uh, 50 million people worldwide with dementia, uh, two thirds of whom uh, have Alzheimer's disease. So it's a, it's a major social and economic problem um, for the world and it's a growing one. So we'd like to solve this problem. Um, from a neuroscience perspective, um, my real interest is how is information processing um, by neural circuits affected by neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are you know, quite a few things that go on in the brains of people who have uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, one uh, of these is the well-known uh, formation of amyloid plaques. It's not the only thing. It is the thing that I'm going to sort of focus on, on today. And I can, I can you know, discuss with interested people some of the other things as well. So you can see these, these sort of amyloid plaques. I mean, you have amyloid uh, protein, and they, the plaques are the, really the uh, conglomerations of, of groups of these that we see. Um, it may well be that um, smaller uh, amounts of amyloid um, uh, protein actually are causing, for instance, soluble amyloid protein are actually causing some of the problems. Uh, in fact, well, whereas it's only when they clump together that we see these really big plaques. So you can see these here in a... Um, an image of the hippocampus. Um, so in, in green, you can see some sort of amyloid plaques that have been labeled there. And yeah, really, we want to know, you know, what what are they actually doing to the, to the underlying circuit there? Um, you can see the, the you know, famous circuit diagram of the hippocampus there. Now, um, why are we looking at amyloid? Well, actually, um, and, and, you know, why are we looking at, um, you know, what are we looking at in, in terms of um, neural circuits? Um, we were really uh, became interested in this as a result of something called the aberrant excitability hypothesis, which um, you know, a little over 10 years ago started to emerge. The previous viewpoint had been very much of sort of a silencing of activity, um, whereas now we think it's a sort of a you know, balance of both um, increases and decreases in excitability. So this is a two photon image um, uh, taken uh, by Mark Earl Bush. Um, 
and in the top the top situation here you can see a, a wild type mouse with over on the right some sort of calcium transients uh, of the level you you, you might expect um, so this is in an area of, of cortex in fact um, at the bottom here's a, a, a wild type so sorry, here's a, um, a mouse model uh, of Alzheimer's the um, APP 23 cross PS 45 model so it's a sort of a dual uh, mouse model that brings in some human um, uh, Alzheimer linked um, uh, genes to the mouse um, and you can see uh, actually in blue here labeled with thioflavin are some of the amyloid plaques and then looking at the cells you can see some of these cells so cell one and cell four here um, are actually um, you know effectively silenced um, cell two seems to be behaving um, approximately normally but cell three and five here are actually um, firing at sort of higher rates there's sort of more calcium transients going on there so there's um, actually a, a hyper excitability. So there are disruption, you know, this is sort of one aspect in which there are disruptions to the, um, to the circuit. Um, now, what tool are we uh, using to approach this? Uh, the tool is the two photon microscope. Um, just as sort of a brief, I mean, people I'm sure know this, but just as sort of a brief summary. Um, so single photon excitation, um, you know, we have, um, you know, light comes in, causes an electron to sort of go up an energy level. When it comes back down, another uh, photon is emitted, um, you know, which you might see um, through a confocal microscope, for instance. With two photon excitation, we're absorbing a pair of photons to, to cause that initial um, um, event with the electron going up the energy level. Um, so the simultaneous absorption of the pair of photons has, you know, got some different physics associated with it. So there's a few different things different going on here. One is that you've got um, light, uh, which has got, um, so each of these photons is half the energy, um, which means it's basically of longer wavelength, longer wavelength light will penetrate better through tissue. So we can effectively seek deeper into tissue with it. The other is that sort of associated with these events, you have a much smaller point spread function. So you can see over here, um, this dot, this corresponds to a, the point spread function of a two photon microscope in comparison to a um, sort of single photon fluorescence scenario. Now, because that dot's small, and we're you know scanning it, we can scan it around in tissue and know where that you know know that the light we've observed you know, came from a particular um, uh, structure, for instance, uh, you know a soma or a dendrite of a cell. And that's what we do. We scan we scan the light around, as, as I'm sure you've seen in in many cases, to build to, to build up images, and then we detect the the photons coming out um, through uh, typically photomultiplayer tubes, as we can see here. Um, and, uh, you know, we can apply this in vivo. So here's some examples of in vivo two photon imaging where we've uh, um, looked at uh, uh, transgenic mouse uh, where green fluorescent protein is expressed in particular classes of cells. Um, in this case, it's in layer five pyramidal cells in cortex. And we can see 800 microns or so deep in, into tissue with this, with this microscope under those conditions. Um, but that, of course, is just a structural signal, not a functional one. And um, really what we want to do is to look at functional signals. So as you've seen in the previous talk, we use um, uh, genetically encodable calcium indicators that, you know, where the fluorescence uh, becomes proportional to the um, amount of calcium in the cell. Um, so we can use that as a readout of activity. Now, to do that, uh, during um, behavior, during a memory task, we have the animal head fixed. Uh, so the animal's in, in the sort of head, head fixation apparatus. I'll show you some of the details of that in a minute. Um, and now we're, in this case, interested in imaging the hippocampus. Um, the hippocampus is a relatively deep structure. So, you know, it's deeper than our 800 microns. We can't see it uh, from the surface of the brain. Uh, so what we can do, um, undesirable, but at the moment this is the way we're doing it, is to aspirate a small amount of tissue above the hippocampus um, and implant a little sort of uh, window uh, that's chronically implanted. Uh, now we do that basically down to the level of the corpus callosum and then and that basically gives us a, a nice sort of stopping point that we can easily see um, area CA1 of the hippocampus um, in our preparation. Um, so um, the way we do these experiments um, in, so we, we have a, a, a green genetically encodable calcium indicator. In this case, it's GCAM6S. Um, uh, we're using viral delivery. 
so we can actually uh, you know change that up, update that as, as new um, indicators become available. For instance, now the sort of you know JG Cam Seven, etc., which uh, are slightly better still. Um, now, motion correction was mentioned in the previous uh, talk. Uh, now you can obviously use the green channel for motion correction, but you've got to keep in mind that with green um, genetically encodable calcium indicators, what they've done over the you know, last few generations of these to increase the, the signal amplitudes is effectively um, reducing the baseline quite a lot. So basically you can't really see the cells very well if they're not firing. Uh, and of course, different sets of cells may fire at different times. This is not so much of an issue in neocortex where cells fire quite a bit, but in an area like hippocampus where the cells are firing relatively sparsely, and you may, for instance, have some cells which are just not firing one day and then the next day they start, um, you know, you really, you, you don't have a good structural image there. So we like to combine it with some kind of um, red structural fluorescent protein as well. In this case, um, we've used um, a, a combined AAV package, which puts both GCAMP6S and MRuby um, into the cells. This is developed by um, Tobias Rosa uh, uh, Munich. Um, and um, in this case, basically, the it, it's putting mRuby into all of the cells so we can use that as a, um, as a structural marker um, to help deal with movement correction, etc. Uh, now, you wouldn't have to put it into all cells. For instance, another thing you can do there would be to um, express it in, uh, say, in just in interneurons or, <clears throat> or something that is, adds additional maybe functional value as well. Um, and then you can still use it as, as a way to sort of have a stable image for uh, movement correction, etc. But uh, you... Um, you can also use it uh, you know, to add uh, effectively an additional channel of information there. <clears throat> so um, you can see just to you know, show you this is just a, a sort of a, a fairly raw video. Um, you've seen some of the sort of nice cleaned up ones earlier, um, I, but this is uh, effectively what you see off the, off the microscope there um, with the, the green channel um, sort of calcium transients uh, sort of being fired. Now, um, to use this to look at... Um, Alzheimer's disease, we need to, so, so we, we're using uh, a number of mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. In particular, the model uh, we're using at the moment is the 5XFAD model. It's a fairly aggressive um, model of early onset Alzheimer's disease. So you start to get amyloid plaques forming after two months or so in mice. Um, and they then progress sort of fairly um, steadily. Um, you get uh, behavioral deficits, et cetera, occurring as well. Um, now, we want to see where... Um, the amyloid plaques are in, in the brain. So typically the way we do these experiments is the first few days we're doing the, um, uh, so we look at mice over a period of up to several weeks, in fact. So the first few days we basically spend mapping the cortex. Uh, we have the laser at uh, 920 nanometers or so to look at um, uh, GCAM6. And what we do is we bring the laser down to 720 nanometers. We've, we inject um, a dimethoxy XO4 uh, which labels fluorescently labels amyloid plaques, and and then you can see these in the in the this sort of magenta sort of channel in these images here. Um, so so during our mapping process, we can sort of co-label, um, at, at, you know, exactly where the amyloid plaques are, um, and then you know later revisit that to sort of build up um, um, you know pictures of of how functional properties of neurons relate to uh, uh, you know, for instance how far they are from the amyloid. Um, I should just say, um, uh, just to um, note that some of the people involved in this uh, part of the work, um, Dr. Marianne Goh is a postdoc, who's been sort of the lead uh, scientist on this, uh, Dr. Jake Rogers, um, uh, who helped us with a lot of the behavioral uh, work here, and uh, um, Siegfried Prado, a PhD student, and Katie Davey, uh, a collaborator, who involved in a lot of the um, uh, analysis work here. Um, so... As I mentioned, we uh, do these experiments in head-fixed mice. Okay, now this is a bit strange because we obviously need these mice to be you know, running around doing a behavioral task. Um, and uh, what we do is we um, we use this... Um, basically, the mice are running on a carbon fiber... They're basically in this sort of carbon fiber um, lightweight chamber, which is sitting on top of, of an airbed, in fact. So... As the mice sort of move their feet, it's it's the chamber that moves rather than the um, rather than the mouse itself. 
um, so they can you know they can explore uh, you know, a number of environments in this case and they can move we could you know in one session we might have seen them tw have spend 20 minutes in one chamber and then we can switch them out over to another chamber so that they can explore that um, one thing to keep in mind is of course that they don't have vestibular signals they are head fixed so they don't have vestibular signals and that of course is actually quite imp important for some aspects of the campbell function we have to keep that in mind um, so you can see on on this slide uh the, basically the behavioral tasks some of the behavioral tasks that we're doing here so at left here this is the the two photo microscope uh, sort of apparatus with one of the one of the little cages in there at the moment um many of the experiments we do it we literally just have the animals running around and around a, a circular track um this, this turns out to be um you know very easy to teach them to uh, to do and uh, um, enables us to get uh, sort of you know good reproducible place cell uh, sort of readout in effect um, but we can have them do other things too we can have them um, you know run around a circular track but with a stop we get them to do y mazes and I'll, I'll show you something on that later on because then that lets us start to do things like um, you know have them choose um, you know which direction to go based upon um, what happened previous times we can do working memory tasks and things as well so you can see down down left in this movie this um, sort of mouse running around the circular the circular track um, uh, in a sort of fairly, fairly typical manner. Um, so they, they learn this uh, this task uh, over over the period of several weeks or so. You can see some sort of example traces at the top here. Um, it it takes them you know around with say a session a day um, you know around sort of ten to fourteen sessions to get really good at it, um, um, and we sort of have as a stopping criterion that basically they're spending enough of their time during the task running we, we, really what we want here is for them uh, to be running in, around enough that we can sort of map place cells well um so so this is a this is a this, the circular track um, we have them also do a an open field um, exploration as well and similarly they're slightly slower at sort of you know basically just learning to, to run around enough um it's the kinematics of this are not quite like the real world of course because it's a sort of a, a near frictionless uh, sort of environment it's we actually have a couple of magnets on on this little um carbon fiber chamber which sort of uh, make the kinematics of it a little more natural in fact um but it's not perfect and if you look at speed distributions um if you compare those so i'm showing the speed distribution in our version of this open field uh, task here. If you compare the speed distribution for, say, a tethered mouse, um, it's so our distribution is maybe slightly longer, longer tail. The average speeds are sort of similar, but the, but we've got a sort of a longer tail distribution there. Um, so, um, what what do we do with this? Well, we actually train them over, over that period that I was sharing the training. There, we expose them to a number of environments. So, um, I'll, I'll call uh, two of these sort of FAM one and FAM two, and they're basically just um, you know, similar um, uh, carbon cages with different um, visuotactile patterns on them um, are used to recognize them. Uh, now, if we if we put them in one um, such chamber, for, you know, and let them say spend 20 minutes exploring it, and then move them to into a second chamber, um, we'll expect to see um, um, a place field remapping. So that's a sort of a feature of um, hippocampal area CA1. You know, the place fields, you move to a new environment, the place fields will effectively um, sort of remap. You're recalling a sort of um, a spatial memory of the new environment that you've seen before that you're going into. So this is a way to test memory recall. And um, on the other hand, another experiment we might do is to, is to put them in this familiar environment for 20 minutes, but then move them to a novel one they haven't seen before at all. And in that case, we can watch sort of memory encoding going on. Um, and we've done both these experiments. I'll, I'll, I'll show you data from this first one. Um, so, so here's some of the data. Um, so here we are imaging CA1 population activity during, during behavior. At the um, left side here is the, the overlay image of sort of green and red channels with, um, in, in some period of activity, you've got a certain set of cells going. So this is what we're looking at here, that um, there's other other times there might be additional cells but using all of that you know together we can sort of pull out the regions of interest corresponding to individual cells this data was actually analyzed with the with the Kaiman package we have a um, we have our own tool as well and um, in for some different things in the lab we use either Kaiman or our own tool but um, basically built within an overall um, uh, pipeline where we can sort of plug and play different different tools together um, 
So you can see from each of these uh, these cells, uh, well, this is actually a selection of 50, 50 of these, I think, um, of this larger set here. You see the calcium time series um, uh, down the bottom here. Um, I'm showing then in these red traces just the position of the mouse as it's running around um, this environment. Um, and then for each of these events, we basically we detect the event. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm plotting a raster plot here, um, which has um, a dot for the, the time of the event and the size of that, the area of that dot corresponds to the amplitude of the event. So rather than trying to de detect individual action potentials, <coughs> we're saying, let's just keep the events, but let's keep an amplitude measure as well. Um, and just for many analysis purposes, that's just a slightly more robust uh, um, uh, response measure to use, we find. Um, so in um, the circular track, we can see um, reliable uh, place cell activity. So we, here's five you know, typical cells. Where we can see um, basically the cell is firing at a particular location around the track here. You can see the individual trial rasters down here. Um, you might notice, actually, that there's a sort of um, slight backward drift there as it goes on. That is actually a general feature. Um, I'm not going to talk about it more here, but it is something we see systematically um, uh, at different rates of sort of movement backwards um, for different cells. And then we can take all of the, you know, all of the cells and sort of stack them together, um, um, uh, sorted according to their, their position. Um, and we see things that are actually fairly similar to um, what you see in freely moving mice in this um, circular track uh, task. Um, in the open field, it's a slightly different picture. Um, we do see some, you know, place cells, but there aren't that many, and the spatial information content is actually uh, somewhat lower. Um, and the reason for this is fairly clear. It, basically, the vestibular information is um, is not there, and they need that vestibular information to build up 2D place fields. Somehow, they don't need it so critically to build up 1D place fields. Um, and our, our 1D place fields are actually um, you know, quite uh, robust, um, uh, sort of despite the lack of that uh, vestibular uh, information there. Um, so, so you know, some of these cells are, are place cells, some, some aren't. There was, I, I think, out of 700 odd uh, cells, like, you know, 250 or something were, were place cells. Um, the place cells actually do fire at slightly higher event rates. Uh, if we look at that in in terms of you know just integrating the amplitudes of these calcium transient events um, and then i'm plotting that on a uh, on a um, log axis uh, there then you see basically a sort of a log normal type distribution of activity with a higher um, rate of activity from place cells than non-place cells um, what about the variability though that's actually uh, kind of an interesting point to look at in this context so you know, as the mouse runs around and around this uh, track, each time it passes a particular location, we can sort of you know, list up it, the activity there. We can um, look at the mean and the variance uh, uh, for all um, times when the mouse was in that location and plot them against each other. So, and so for each cell, I've got two example cells on this plot here. Um, there's a, a place cell and a non-place cell. Um, as, the, as the mouse goes to, um, you know, through, for instance, um, uh, the point of it, where its place field is, you're going to have a high mean rate at other points, a, a, a lower one. We can sort of plot that. And you end up with a something that looks like a straight line on, on log log with the slope of that line giving you a, um, a sort of a, a coefficient which describes really the, the variability um, of that um, of that cell. Now, despite the fact that the place cells have higher, very, higher firing rates, actually they have lower variability exposures. Um, so... Uh, that's actually kind of interesting. Now, sort of coming back to, um, you know, what kind of circuit changes we might see during dementia, this is something that we're, we're sort of looking at in, in detail. I don't have results to show, to show you on that for the uh, Alzheimer mice at the moment, but, uh, uh, but the fact that, um, you know, the place cells, the ones that are showing the, you know, the memory phenomena here are actually have the sort of lower variability suggests that um, this is something kind of crucial to look at in, in terms of um, dementia. Um, Simon, you have around yep. five minutes left. Okay, thank you. Um, so the place cells remap across environments. Um, just to sort of uh, uh, reiterate that, um, this, this just sort of shows some exa an example of that. You take it from uh, environment A, move it into environment B, but keep the sorting the same. Um, then you basically see nothing. On the other hand, if you resort according to um, the activity in environment B, then you get a you know a nice sort of 
again, um, sort of place place field maps. Um, so um, it, that's sort of a signature that you have had this remapping going on. And again, that's something we might see as a sort of um, measure of um, of the memory recall uh, performance going on here to look at. Uh, the last thing we've looked at here is, or the second last thing is neural manifold analysis. So we've, you know, that's single cell properties. What about looking at the, all of the cells together here? Um, we've done classical multidimensional scaling for this with a sort of cosine distance where, you know, we take the pattern of activity um, uh, across all cells at two points in time, um, use uh, the cosine distance between those to look at how, how far apart they are. That sort of gives you a time by time matrix that you then perform MDS on and, and, um, and you get a sort of a time by number of dimensions. Uh, matrix you can sort of plot here and you can see that in with mds uh, you know you can recover basically you know, with some noise you can recover where the where the mouse is in, in space over that um, we did compare different manifold analysis methods um, uh, for doing this and mds in our hands of the methods we've tried seems to be sort of showing the, the best results on both real and simulated data um, there are other analyses we can do um, that I won't sort of go through for reasons of time here in, in detail, but you know, recurrence analysis, et cetera, starts to let us get at the sort of the structure of, of, of sort of what's going on here and maybe sort of some, you know, might provide some sort of sensitive measures of changes in, in these manifolds that we see with particular circuit uh, changes um, that we might expect uh, in disease states. Um, we, we're applying this now to working memory tasks. It's just a, you know, one slide up to show that, that that task is working. We, we don't have imaging results with it yet, but um, but we can do it. Um, and then the final thing to show is um, a nice thing with this technique is we can sort of go back day after day. So here's sort of three, you know, one mouse over three days where we can look at the same cells and see how they change over days. Um, we can do that over, over several weeks. Um, you know, the computational aspects of this are, are, of course, still challenging, sort of knowing that you've got the same cells, et cetera, um, doing this robustly, um, uh, but um, uh, well worth doing because, of course, this starts to get at, um, at questions that are very hard to get at with other techniques of sort of how um, the information represented by individual cells sort of ch you know, changes sort of longitudinally over extended periods of time. Um, so to summarize, um, uh, we've sort of developed a sort of a, a pipeline and by pipeline I mean here really both the, the hardware and you know integrating the sort of software aspects that lets us look at calcium imaging calcium signals in populations of neurons during a spatial memory task um, we can do this with working memory tasks as well um, we can sort of study how the properties as derived from the calcium signals um, you know change as a function of you know, how uh, you know how near the cells are to, to amyloid for instance um, and um, you know, we can use it to look at memory recall, but also memory encoding um, with variants of the task and to track the same neurons over sort of multiple weeks. So with that, I'd like to um, end by acknowledging some of the people involved. I've mentioned some of these people already, just to add a, a couple of new students who've been working on this memory task as well. Um, and to thank our funders, um, in particular, Mrs. Ann Neuron, uh, who provided a philanthropic donation that allowed uh, much of this work to take place. Um, and so thank you for uh, paying attention to me. Yeah, thank you very much, Simon, for this really very nice talk. Um, I have two questions from the audience, um, and I think probably in the interest of time, we should um, redirect all the other questions to Neurostars. Okay. So the first question is from um, Alex Dimitrov. Yep. He asks, is the platform inertia matched to the mouse inertia? So, um, um, yes, although possibly not in units of inertia per se, we do sort of calibrate for a, the weight of a particular mouse. We've adjusted that exactly to get, and we adjust the pressure level, etc., so that this is, uh, this is sort of balanced. Um, it was crucial to use those magnets, actually. In early versions of the task, basically, it was a bit too sort of free. The mice, mice learn it as a task, right? But nevertheless, the kinematics were a bit too, too sort of free, and the magnets really improved the sort of realistic nature of the, of the task and allowed the mouse to learn it better. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, the next question is from um, Maurizio. So... Um, he um, can actually probably ask the question himself because he has to announce the next speaker anyway. Okay. So I will invite him on screen. Maurizio. 
<laughs> oh, so I have to ask him directly the question yes. online. Okay, I didn't have the chance to answer the, 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 the question by, by script. So you show, Simon, very nice talk. So you show uh, play cells are probably firing more during disease the condition. That's what, what uh, they got. Well, this was in, that was in wild time, okay? So okay. I haven't shown, I mean, I've presented this as a kind of, we're doing this in, in mouse models of, uh, of Alzheimer's, but those were wild type mice, I should be clear. So do you have already any, any finding, like preliminary finding? What is the preliminary observation in AD? Um, uh, nothing I can really say because we have one cohort of mice but they were only two months old. So it okay. was probably too early. They were yeah, one cohort of um, the 5XFAD mice, two months old. So sort of too early to say anything about. And we've intentionally not kind of looked at that because we don't want to kind of demask ourselves. Okay, so then I guess so that my question that you will yeah. be able to read down is a little bit far-fetched by now, but if yeah. you can address the comment there, I will... Uh, catch up with you later. Meanwhile, we proceed uh, now with uh, the next speaker of today's session, who is Michael Grapner uh, from the Laboratoire de Physiologie Cerebral at l'Université Paris Descartes uh, in Paris. So, um, because <coughs> I like the anecdotal introductions, Michael and I probably know by now, uh, for 10 years, I saw him when I was about to move to Chicago to Nicola Brunel, when he was actually getting out from Nicola Brunel, who, with whom he did his uh, PhD, and he was starting his postdoc at Alex Reyes uh, in, in NYU. Then uh, later on, he moved back to France at Boris Working uh, Group, I think working on addiction. And then uh, eventually, um, no, maybe I see that it was before going to Alex Reyes, we were at Boris Working, and then back you were with Isabel Yano. And now uh, he's at the Laboratory of Physiology, uh, Cerebral Physiology, as a permanent researcher there. And uh, with that uh, in mind, I don't hesitate to just uh, let uh, the stage to Michael, who will talk uh, uh, about calcium as trigger of synaptic plasticity and natural firing pattern. Michael, and the stage is yours, and thank you very much for presenting this work. Thank you very much, Maurizio, for this kind introduction. Just uh, can you give me a short feedback whether everybody can see my slide and whether the sound is fine? I can see everything, so I suppose that everyone has Okay, to okay perfect. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, Peng Sing, Mauricio, and Ivo for inviting me to this workshop and also for organizing this workshop. It seems to be more work than I would have thought. So my talk um, follows in the line of uh, Jonathan's talk. So I want to talk about calcium as a trigger of synaptic plasticity. So how ca calcium relays information between uh, neural activity and synaptic plasticity. And in particular, I want to focus on how plasticity uh, is shaped by neural natural firing patterns. By this, I mean irregular firing patterns. So it kind of follows in the same style as Jonathan's talk, who wanted to talk about how plasticity is shaped by uh, more physiologically, uh, physiological calcium concentrations. So I will spend some more time on, on my introduction since, uh, uh, since we haven't heard the entirety of Jonathan's talk. Um, I, quickly introduced the calcium-based uh, plasticity model, well, maybe a bit longer. I then want to dive into um, uh, how uh, irregular firing patterns shape plasticity. And I want to finish uh, my talk with some experimental data on cortical stridal plasticity, where some of the predictions from the model on irregular uh, uh, firing patterns and plasticity have been tested. So let's start out with the calcium-based plasticity model. I will start very basic. So as, as many of you uh, probably know, if um, uh, neurons which are uh, connected with the synapse uh, are shown uh, particular stimulation patterns, uh, the, the connection st strength or the weight or the efficacy of this synapse connecting those two neurons can uh, change. 
and the simulation pattern uh, which have been identified to change the uh, condition strength or spike frequency stimulation of presynaptic neurons. This is kind of the traditional protocol to induce plasticity. And more recently, or the turn of the centuries, uh, spike timing dependent plasticity has been discovered. Uh, spike timing means that the, the relative timing between pre and postsynaptic uh, uh, spikes define the uh, change of synaptic strength. So those two general uh, definitions of uh, stimulation protocols have been shown to be able to decrease synaptic strength um, or to increase synaptic strength. And if uh, those two changes are long lasting and uh, an experiment uh, and slice back experiments is often defined as longer than one hour, then the decrease has been termed long-term depression and the increase has been termed long-term potentiation. Well, just to just to set the nomenclature uh, of this talk right here. I'm sure this is very basic for, for many of you. So what I will be mostly talking about is, is uh, how to describe the link between activity patterns which occur in those two neurons and the synaptic plasticity induced as, at the synapse or the synapses uh, connecting those two neurons. And um, so our, and the, 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 the idea here is that once we have a, a, a way to describe or th this link between activity dependence and, and uh, plasticity for uh, experimental simulation protocols or for known simulation protocols, we might use this, uh, this model, this link here to infer uh, plasticity for stimulation protocols which uh, have not been or which can only be tested um, uh, with great difficulty in experiments, as in vivo, for example. So this is the situation. We have uh, pre- and postsynaptic neurons uh, firing or uh, exhibit, exhibiting some activity pattern. And uh, we have uh, a synapse which changes its weight or its uh, efficacy. And um, we will use uh, calcium as providing the link between those stimulation protocols and the synaptic changes. Um, as it is supported by many experiments which have shown that the postsynaptic uh, calcium evaluation is both uh, necessary and a sufficient signal at many synapses to induce uh, long-term plasticity, so LTD L and, or LTB. Uh, this idea was uh, first proposed by, uh, in a model proposed by Shuval et al. in 2002, and he termed it the calcium control hypothesis. Again, this really uh, uh, rests on many experiments showing that calcium is uh, a crucial trigger to uh, for synaptic plasticity. So let me explain the model in, uh, in, in more detail. So the model basically uh, uh, is biologically inspired and it, uh, it, it accounts for the fact that pre- and postsynaptic spikes induce calcium transients at the postsynaptic spine. So here you see uh, pre- and postsynaptic neurons firing uh, spikes at different locations, and each of the spikes is accompanied by a calcium transient, um, which, which uh, is supposed to model calcium uh, dynamics at the postsynaptic spine. You see that those calcium transients are modeled in a very simple fashion. So they have an immediate rise time, a single exponential decay, but the, the calcium amplitudes of uh, presynaptic spikes are small and the calcium amplitudes in, induced by postsynaptic spikes are, are large here. The model then uses this compound calcium trace and, uh, and introduces thresholds. And those thresholds stand for uh, signaling cascades, biological signaling cascades, which lead to a synaptic depression or synaptic potentiation. And here in this case, you see that the depression uh, threshold is lower and the poten uh, potentiation threshold is larger. So that basically means whenever the calcium trace uh, crosses the depression threshold, synaptic rate is decreased, as you can see here. If it uh, crosses both thresholds, since potentiation is faster, the net effect is uh, 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 an increase of synaptic weight. Um, and then um, that that and that is already this already provides in a very simplified uh, fashion uh, the link between activity and synaptic efficacy. 
Then in the model, uh, one can introduce uh, stability landscape of the synaptic weight. So in the original model, we uh, we used experimental data proposing a bi binary synapse and introduced this um, um, cubic uh, an energy landscape such that the synapse has uh, only two stable states in the absence of activity, so a down and an up state. And this is how how does how this model is written down in uh, differential equation. W is the synaptic weight. This is the depression term, which activates whenever the calcium trace combined calcium trace crosses the depression threshold. This is the potentiation term, which is activates whenever calcium crosses the potentiation threshold. This is the bistability term, uh, generating this uh, uh, those two stable states in the absence of uh, activity, and we also added activity dependent noise, which is present whenever there uh, there is synaptic transmission. So, as a first test uh, uh, for this model was to um, model the spike timing dependent plasticity, and uh, so Jonathan spoke at this for uh, about this curve in the beginning of this experiment so this is basically what uh, uh b and bo and Markram saw uh, at the end of the 20th century when using pre and postsynaptic spike pairs and varying this, the time delay between those spike pairs and here in the model uh, let me play this uh, simulation again so you see that there's a pre and a postsynaptic spike both introduce uh, calcium transients of different amplitudes. And this blue trace here shows you the compound calcium trace. In this panel, you see uh, the time of those two traces spent above, uh, 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 above the depression and potentiation threshold. And in this last panel, you see a weighted difference between those two uh, uh, traces. So we impose here that uh, pre and post spikes, which are far apart from each other, so large delta t values don't induce any plasticity. So we want this curve to converge to zero for large delta t, negative and positive. And uh, you see uh, that at the, at the delta t range of interactions, we get uh, a, de a depression, so uh, um, a reduction of the synaptic weight. And for positive delta t values, we get an increase of synaptic weight. And let me play uh, play the video again. So you see here at negative delta t value, uh, the depression uh, is is um, is particularly or is uh, only depression uh, time above the depression uh, threshold increases uh, only at, a, at at this delta t value. Uh, the potentiation threshold is uh, is hit, and then the time above the uh, potentiation increases. So. If you subtract those curves, uh, if you create a weighted sum, uh, weighted subtraction of those curves, you end up with this SDP um, uh, curve. Um, so, what do we need in order to get this curve? So, uh, it depends on the, the uh, on the calcium uh, amplitudes induced by pre and postsynaptic spikes, as you can imagine. And we we impose that again that uh, large LD values don't uh, lead to any plasticity. Um, so this is a very full slide, but let me walk you through it. It's uh, uh, what we do here. The only thing we change now, uh, and this is in this phase plane, is the uh, pre and the postsynaptic uh, calcium uh, amplitude. So we started in this panel. So the postsynaptic calcium uh, induced calcium amplitude was larger than the presynaptic calcium amplitude, and this leads to this uh, SDP curve. The, uh, with LTD at negative uh, um, delta T values and uh, potentiation at positive delta T values. What you see in this figure that is that if the calcium uh, amplitudes change with respect to the uh, depression and the potentiation threshold, we get a zoo of qualitatively different uh, spike timing dependent plasticity curves. So here, if both calcium transients, for example, are large, uh, one gets a curve which only is marked by potentiation in the interaction range. If both are small, one gets a curve where only the potentiation, sorry, the depression uh, threshold is crossed and one sees only depression, et cetera, et cetera. We were very excited when we first saw this, uh, this, this figure because some of those curves have been measured experimentally. So let me start again by the, by the known curve, which uh, has been discovered at, uh, at the hippocampus and in the, uh, in the cortex. So LTD for negative uh, de uh, delta T values and LTP for positive delta T values. But as I told you, some of those curves, those symmetric curves, um, 
or the uh, inverse order of um, of uh, with LTP at negative delta D values and LTD uh, uh, at positive delta D values have been measured at uh, at different uh, synapses and different systems. So what this suggests is that maybe some of this diversity in observed SDP uh, uh, roles can be explained by the differences in the underlying calcium dynamics at those uh, at those synapses. All right. Let me now uh, move on to the to the to the to the main part of my talk using this calcium-based uh, plasticity model, and study how plasticity might be shaped by irregular firing patterns. So first, uh, let me point out uh, how classical uh, sim experimental simulation protocols look like, which are used to induce plasticity. So uh, by a presynaptic frequency stimulation uses trains of presynaptic action potentials, which are regularly paced. Spike pair stimulation uses uh, spike pairs, which are regularly paced and always reproduce the same delta T across uh, 60 or 100 pairs. And uh, the same for, for uh, combinations of spike frequency and spike, uh, uh, spike pair stimulation. Of course, those stimulation protocols uh, are in, in large contrast to what we know how activity looks like in vivo, which is very irregular for single uh, for, from uh, from single neurons, and which can, which can be correlated between pairs of neurons. Here you see the cross correlation cross correlation in um, um, in, in the spike timing between pairs of cells in the visual cortex. So this, uh, this zoom in here is 50 milliseconds. And this, what this peak tells you that yes, when one neuron fires, there's a large probability that the other neuron fires as well. So they are correlated in their action potential firing. But this correlation is, uh, is not as peaked as uh, SDB. So it, it happens over a range of the, uh, delta, T, delta T values. So what we wondered is, what happens to plasticity if one were to use more uh, natural looking firing patterns or more regular, irregular firing patterns? And as a first step to more uh, to those uh, regular firing patterns, we introduced uh, those irregular spike pairs. Um, so this is the regular spike uh, SDP stimulation protocol, uh, fixed delta T values with uh, fixed inter pair intervals. And um, the only thing we changed here is that the inter pair intervals is now Poisson distributed. So we have the presynaptic neuron fire basically a Poisson process. And every time the presynaptic neuron fires, we add um, we add a postsynaptic spike with a fixed uh, delta T. So this is still very unrealistic because the delta T between pre and postsynaptic spike is fixed. So the cross correlation function is still peak. But uh, we, re we relax uh, this uh, regular inter pair intervals uh, between um, um, of the of the original stimulation protocol, so it happens to plasticity. This is the SDB curve. So spike pair uh, stimulation with, uh, as a function of delta T value um, uh, for regular uh, spike pair stimulation. If we move to irregular spike pair stimulation, uh, uh, the same curve uh, is shown here uh, in in orange. Again. Blue curve is for regular spike pairs and the orange curve for irregular spike pairs. So you see uh, that so two things happen. The entire curve is lifted upwards, less LTD and more LTP, more potentiation is induced. And uh, moreover, and very strikingly, is that uh, varying delta D leads to very or leads to smaller flat uh, variations in the uh, synaptic uh, change. Um, uh, then with the original uh, regular stimulation uh, protocol. This is a summary figure for different uh, stimulation frequencies. So uh, different uh, frequencies at which those spike pairs uh, occur. So I should so, uh, say rates because uh, again, those spike pairs occur now uh, in an irregular fashion. And you say that uh, those conclusions that the mover, uh, the curve uh, moves upward and uh, delta T has, has a less of an impact or increase, it decreases the dynamic range and synaptic efficacy applies uh, across all those, uh, those frequencies. This is a, a, a result which has been published and we, we checked that this, is result, this result is not specific for the calcium-based plasticity model. We also used the triplet model um, 
and it, it shows exactly the same effect. So it seems to be a, a general feature uh, of those two of those two models. Okay, let me uh, move to the last uh, part of my talk, uh, during which I want to present uh, some uh, some experimental data, some unpublished data. Uh, um, and so this is based on a uh, collaboration uh, with Laurent Venance, who we managed to convince to test some of our predictions uh, of, of plasticity with irregular uh, firing patterns. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me let me also reiterate our approach. So what have we done so far? We used uh, we used the calcium-based plasticity model to fit. Um, to fit it to, to a known plasticity uh, data obtained in, uh, in the visual cortex or the hippocampus. So this is model is uh, fitted to data on regular and chitted stimulation protocols. Then we used uh, the same model with this parameter sets which we obtained from fitting those experimental results and we, uh, we predict how the model might look like, um, um, how the model might perform if uh, irregular stimulation patterns um, are exposed to the model, or if uh, uh, irregular stimulation patterns are played to the model. This this approach might fail in two situations. Uh, so either uh, so we have not we have a limited number of data points. So those the data points we use to fit the model to might under constrain the model. Or the model is simply uh, not complex enough to 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 capture or to generalize uh, plasticity beyond the stimulation patterns which have been used in, the, in those experiments. So we we wanted to, to 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 test how well this 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 prediction of the model with irregular stimulation um, uh, holds with experiments. And for this, we con uh, we teamed up with uh, Laurent Venance, who is here at the College of France in Paris. And they study uh, synaptic plasticity and the cortical stridal synapse, so and stimulate uh, fiber bundles in the cortex and record from me, uh, median spinal spiny neurons in the stridum. And uh, this synapse for uh, regular spike pair stimulation shows an inverted STP curve. So note here that LTP potentiation occurs at negative delta T values, and depression LTD occurs at positive uh, delta T values. That's an uh, Exactly inverse at the uh, uh, the time axis with respect to uh, hippocampal or the cortical uh, SDP I mentioned before. So <clears throat> those experiments uh, with regular spike pair stimulation uh, and uh, what they uh, what the experiment did here they varied the stimul uh, the, the rate at which those spike pairs were presented. Presented the range goes from one hertz up to, all the way up to ten hertz, and you see. Uh, so the individual the experiments are shown in gray, bin data points are in orange, and the blue line here is uh, a fit of the calcium-based plasticity model to this experimental data. So the, the, the model does a, uh, a good job in fitting this very noisy data set. Uh, so you see already here 10, uh, 10 hertz delta T, or uh, changing delta T doesn't seem to uh, uh, change much the uh, plasticity induced. Okay, so we use again this uh, um, data from regular spike pair stimulation to fit the model, and then um, use the model to predict how how uh, those SDP curves would look like if one were to use irregular spike pairs. For one hertz stimulation, the model predicts that the LTP window at negative delta D values gets larger and LTD almost gets lost. So this uh, LTD part here uh, almost vanishes. And already at three hertz, the model predicts that uh, changing delta D will not change much uh, the uh, something plasticity uh, uh, induced, and one would see uh, potentiation all across uh, across all delta T values. And this is how the data looks like. So this is now uh, imposing those irregular spike pairs uh, as we generate them in a the model. So having a presynaptic cell firing a Poisson process and adding a postsynaptic uh, spike with a fixed delta T uh, to every presynaptic spike to this uh, cortical stridal synapses. And you see the data uh, seems to confirm that the LTP window uh, gets larger. And so we are still working on this part here uh, uh, to, to get closer into this LTD uh, range and see uh, the, you know, how the LTD window here behaves with the irregular 
simulation protocols. For three hertz stimulation, even though the model does not match the quantitative value of plasticity induced, the qualitative shape that uh, changing delta D uh, does not affect the uh, uh, change in scientific, scientific strength uh, seems to hold also for the experiments. So we were very encouraged by um, by 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 those by those uh, by those experimental results, and we went uh, we went a step further. So we were wondering um, what 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 part or what uh, motif or activity pattern in this trace here um, is responsible uh, for or most carries the plasticity induced at at three hertz. And uh, well, very natural and also uh, not very uh, original. So we, we we checked how how plasticity might be uh, might be sensitive to bursts in those uh, irregular spike burst stimulation protocols. So we basically stripped away all single um, individual spikes from the stimulation protocol and only played the bursts uh, occurring uh, in the stimulation protocol to the model. And uh, you see here the model prediction in purple doesn't predict much change from the full irregular stimulation protocol. And uh, this seems to be also the case in the experiment. So this, those orange uh, points here are our first experimental data from our collaborators using this burst stimulation protocol. So again, in all the individual spike pairs have been stripped off and only uh, uh, burst uh, stimulation better have been played to the synapses. And it seems to reproduce the same plasticity as with the full irregular uh, uh, stimulation protocol, suggesting that the bursts are the ones which uh, are carrying the plasticity induced um, at, the, those, uh, uh, at, the stim at the stimulation protocol. Michael, you have around five minutes. All right, uh, I will probably finish uh, before time because uh, uh, that brings me to my uh, summary slide. I hope I didn't move too fast. So, um, there are two 2K home matches. I, uh, I did not spend much time, but um, let me tell you that, um, I, but I spent some time on, on introducing the calcium-based plasticity model and, uh, and explained that uh, changing the calcium um, am amplitudes and uh, their situation with respect to the thresholds can induce, uh, can lead to very different uh, SCDP uh, learning curves. And in, in, in our paper, we show that it can um, reproduce many aspects of the experimental, experimentally ob observed plasticity phenomenology. I then, I then moved on to, um, to, to consider natural firing patterns and how they sh might shape plasticity. And, uh, and our, our, what I showed here is that the model suggests that um, that is as if the sensitivity to spike timing might be much reduced when using uh, irregular uh, spike pairs. And uh, this is a prediction which we uh, set out to, to test experimentally, and this prediction seems to hold uh, at least at the level of the cortical striatal synapse. Um, I'd like to, to, uh, to, to end this talk by thanking uh, the people who are involved in this work. So the work started really early during my PhD with Nicolas Prinel. It then moved on with Sergen Ostertis, uh, with whom um, um, we considered the uh, plasticity in response to uh, irregular spike pairs. And more recently, we teamed up uh, with those guys at the Collège de France, who, who performed actually uh, the experiments at the cortical striatal systems, testing some of our predictions and testing the irregular spike pair stimulation protocols. Sylvana now moved on to New York, but she was at the College of France before. I also would like to thank my current lab, which is at uh, the University of saint Pierre, and uh, our, my current funding sources. Thank you for your attention, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to, uh, to take questions. Thank you, Michael. Thank you and um, so, uh, uh, just before we go on for the next uh, three minutes of questions, I would like to reassure all the audience that uh, please stay tuned because uh, Jonathan al Hadef uh, will be able to speak after uh, Michael. So we probably we should have solved this, this issue with the mic. So thank you for your patience. So now I'd like to <clears throat> ask uh, you a couple of questions. Stefan Grein is asking specifically how you're solving your ODEs in your model. Oh, so um, the model 
is actually for the uh, it's so simple that for the regular simulation protocol, the um, the the, the um, the plasticity induced depends on the time those calcium traces spend uh, above the depression and the potentiation threshold. And since we uh, choose uh, the same exponential decay, uh, the same time constant, we can calculate those, those times analytically and calculate analytically the change in synaptic weight. Um, in the in the work with uh, Serge and Ostrich, we showed that this can also be done for Poisson distributed spike trains. So, uh, we can calculate the changes in, in the synaptic strength in this model analytically for uh, for regular, but also for Poisson distributed spike trains. But we also we also uh, published um, uh, a version in this uh, in which the dynamics of this model is updated in a in an event based manner. So uh, basically, calcium traces and synaptic weight is uh, updated on, on the uh, um, the occurrence of each individual spike, which which is very fast. And um, and is it analytically accepted. I hope I I responded to this question correctly. Is it? May I ask uh, just on top of that? Yeah. So the, the way of solving it stays still the one that you used in the original TNIS paper from 2012, or there is some other technique? Uh, no, the, the technique remains the same. However, that uh, calculating the time spent above uh, the threshold becomes becomes more complicated when uh, when when uh, spike times are distributed uh, uh, like a sound train. Okay. And uh, the analytics for that are presented in the uh, in the chain neuroscience paper with uh, with Pascal Balaj and Serge Mastrich. On on the same uh, on the same uh, version. So Rebecca Evans is actually asking if you can give us a little bit of insights on how precisely. Calcium traces look when you consider irregular versus regular uh, pairs. So, um, unfortunately, I don't have a figure here, but I think this 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 sketch here already shows you how they look like if you use irregular spike trains. So they are just basically all over the place. You might have spike pairs uh, which happen to be next to each other, so inducing large transients. So calcium transients which add up uh, between individual spike pairs, while with regular spike pairs you get a repeated pattern of spike pairs which uh, remains uh, constant during the entire stimulation protocol. So the stimulation protocols consists of of uh, many spike pairs, so 60 to 100, and with regular spike pairs you basically will oscillate uh, uh, around the same uh, maximum and minimum values. Whereas with a regular spike pair, the dynamic range is much larger. So, yeah, I apologize, but this is again this is a sketch which tells you which shows you how it will look like for a regular spike spike trains. And the last question uh, before mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Jonathan can be invited in uh, is from Joel Tabat from Exeter University in the UK, which I take the occasion also to to, to read. And uh, so he's asking actually uh, if you can give some insights on what is happening to the STD. Uh, if the delay between pre and post spikes varies. What happens with the SCP curve uh, if the delay between uh, pre and post spikes vary? Mm -hmm. So um, I hope I understand this uh, discussion correctly. So the delay between pre and post spikes is it's shown here on the x-axis. So that is the variable which is changed along the x-axis. It's a, it's a relative time difference between pre and post -synaptic spikes. I, this is, I assume, I assume, yes, I assume the question is in this sense, although he might uh, ask uh, in the, that in the context of irregular versus regular spikes. So, yeah, so I, don't please, know, yeah, I don't know if uh, Joel maybe can elaborate on that uh, in the comments of this question. So, please specify if you don't mean it. So, again, also here for a uh, uh, regular versus regular spikes, the relative timing, so this, this value delta here, which is uh, indicated by those gray, gray brackets, is varied uh, along the x-axis. This value here uh, indicates the delta D value. So changing the delta D value uh, with regular stimulation protocol leads to those uh, peaky curves. And with irregular spike pairs, 
uh, synaptic plasticity changes only the only middle. Hence our uh, uh, conclusion that the impact of spike timing is reduced. Okay. I see that the Joel. Oh yes. Yeah. So okay. thanks. Yeah, I, that's true. So of course, um, delta D might not be constant. And uh, as I mentioned during the talk, so this is still very un, uh, unnatural that delta D might 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 or is fixed drawing drawing the entire simulation protocol. But so this is kind of an um, an upper limit on how its spike timing might uh, influence plasticity. Imagine delta D values. Uh, delta D, uh, the delta D value varies during the simulation protocol, then uh, those curves would become flatter because what happens mathematically is that you actually integrate from, uh, you create a convolution of of, uh, of those curves with the actual cross correlation between the pre and postsynaptic neurons. So you will, uh, yeah. Okay, so maybe you can also, you know, for, for all the speakers so far, you can also address uh, your questions and further comments in the ask a question button below, or you can move uh, your uh, discussion also to the Neurostar platform. I will post again the link in, uh, in a few seconds. And uh, with that on, thank you, Michael. And uh, we are thank glad you, to we are glad to invite you over, uh, Jonathan Al Hadef. So I give you a very quick uh, introduction on who is Jonathan. Jonathan and I basically know each other for the past, uh, I guess, 12 years. Uh, incidentally, we, we know such that when I arrive, he leaves and he go across the ocean, uh, more or less in the same fashion. So we started about 12 years ago in Israel when Jonathan came uh, in the office of the lab where we were going to start together and I was doing my PhD and he wanted to get uh, possession of the only wide uh, desk uh, that we had there. So luckily I went over during the weekend and I took uh, the desk before him, but no problem. He went to San Diego where he got his PhD and the stage is yours, Jonathan. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to talk about some work with uh, Yanni Singerbert, who was a student of Dominique Deban, and uh, the modeling and theory was with Nicolas Brunel. Um, okay, so um, this is a plot that uh, is very familiar, and also after Michael's talk, I should probably skip most of the introduction, uh, but I guess I would like to emphasize two problems with um, the classical view of spike timing dependent plasticity, uh, one from an experimental point of view, even though this was um, reported uh, more than 20 years ago, still it's unclear whether this kind of plasticity rule applies in vivo. Um, and um, from a theoretical point of view, we can do this uh, uh, exercise, um, this, uh, thought experiment and say that uh, we visit the pyramids and uh, there's some spike pattern that potentiates the synapse when we visit the pyramids, this potentiated synapse represents our memory of, um, of the pyramids. But then when we visit other landmarks, uh, the random activity in, in the network will can depress uh, the same synapse. And so we can ask how long does it take until um, the memory of us visiting the pyramids is erased. And if we take a model, uh, uh, a result like this seriously, that time is much, much uh, shorter than the characteristic time over which we uh, we retain memories in, in real life. So, so there seems to be a problem that we would like to reconcile. Um, we're going to use similar modeling techniques to, um, to what Michael just talked about, but we're going to focus on the role of uh, different levels of the exocellular calcium where Michael focused on uh, timing and firing rate. As far as I could see, I could not see all of it, all of his talk. Um, okay, so uh, why do we think that uh, calcium would be important for? Um, the level of exocellular calcium would be important for inducing plasticity. Well, if the exocellular level is high, when calcium channels open, the flux into the cell will be... Um, uh, will be large if the, the concentration outside uh, the cell is low. The, these fluxes will be small. Uh, Michael already showed you 
evidence that the level of uh, calcium transients inside the postsynaptic cell uh, are important, but this uh, review here um, looks at the um, ex extensive experimental evidence for um, the molecular cascades that induce uh, plasticity, both long-term depression and long-term potentiation. And um, at the top of all these, or many of these molecular cascades is uh, the calcium ion. So um, this is kind of um, the background to, to the kind of modeling that Michael just described that he started uh, about 10 years ago and uh, some work of Harel Shuval even uh, before that. So um, from the, the, the experiments and the modeling that uh, we did is uh, wants to understand uh, what is the plasticity rule that is valid in physiological conditions and uh, maybe in vivo. In non-physiological conditions, we know that there is this um, uh, classical curve with uh, long-term depression and long-term potentiation. So um, our, the goal of our modeling, uh, which uh, is very similar to the uh, goal of the modeling that Michael just described, is to have a, a model that can allow us to describe plasticity at arbitrary spike trends, but also at arbitrary levels of uh, the extracellular calcium. And uh, the experiments that we worked with um, ha repeated the same protocols at multiple levels of the extracellular calcium. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is to describe the structure of uh, the model. Uh, there are some, some important parts of the model are overlapping with um, what Michael showed, but there are some important differences uh, that, I will, uh, that I will also mention. So um, this is uh, the uh, slide describing the, the, the calcium transients in the model. So I assume that um, this is very similar to what Michael just showed, um, but just to uh, recap, so when the presynaptic neuron in our model, when the presynaptic neuron is active uh, due to an NMDA receptor activation, there's an exponentially decaying transient um, that we model mathematically as a convolution of uh, the presynaptic spike train with, um, with an exponential filter. Um, Similarly, when the postsynaptic neuron spikes, they're uh, due to voltage-dependent calcium channel activation. Um, there is an exponentially decaying transient, which again is modeled, is written mathematically as a convolution. And uh, importantly, um, there are nonlinear interactions, which uh, we find are very important uh, to, to be taken into account. So uh, it's known that um, when the uh, when the pre and the postsynaptic neurons are active uh, simultaneously or almost sim simultaneously, calcium transients are amplified non-linearly. So uh, both due to backpropagating action potentials and due to dendritic NMDA spikes. So our model does not differentiate between these two mechanisms. We model one NMDA nonlinearity, which is the product of these two transients. And I'll uh, talk of, about why we chose this structure in the next slide. Um, so we, we take the product of these two transients, uh, which is then amplified and convolved with a second uh, exponential filter, which has a long time scale. So the time scale of um, transients are about 20 milliseconds. The, transient, the time scale of the long, the multiplicative transient is about uh, 100 milliseconds. These were fit to data, but um, uh, these are the time scales that we expect to see. And, um, and uh, I'm going to show in the next slide why we expect these kinds of time scales. So um, like in, uh, very similar to what Michael just showed, there's um, uh, the, the transients that lead to plasticity are a simple sum of these three contributions. And, and again, we use um, these two thresholds that he talked about for uh, determining uh, the change of synaptic weight. Uh, unlike his model, um, we use uh, a synapse with no bistability, not, not because we think that uh, the synapse is not bistable, it's just that um, Introducing the bistability increases the number of parameters that one has to fit, and we were able to 
fit a model without this pre-stability, which still gives uh, good results. So uh, for the sake of simplicity of the modeling, we we had um, synaptic weight, weight dynamics, which were not bistable. Um, so uh, our main focus is on the effect of the extracellular calcium. So you can imagine that this is uh, this cartoon is what would be expected for three millimolar. But then when you uh, reduce the extracellular calcium um, to 1.8 and 1.3 millimolar, which are the upper and lower bound of the physiological range, the same uh, pre and post synaptic uh, spike protocol uh, that in high calcium led to potentiation in intermediate levels of calcium will lead to depression and at low calcium would lead to no uh, change. So um, I'm not going to go into the details of uh, fitting. I want to, uh, in the next slide, uh, look at some symmetry properties and qualitative features of the, the data that uh, was collected in Dominique de Ban's lab and see how from that um, these features of uh, these qualitative features of the data we can uh, deduce something about the model structure that we we should expect. Um, so the first thing we can do is look at the STDP curve at three millimolar calcium. These are pairs of spikes. And um, we see that uh, this is uh, very similar to um, uh, previous experiments. We see that there's a, um, when you change the relative timing of pre and post by about 20 milliseconds, this leads to um, a big change in the resulting synaptic plasticity. So from this, we deduce that uh, the, the single neuron transients or some, some transients in the model have to be um, on the order of 20 milliseconds, otherwise they would smear the timing information and uh, the STDP curve would not uh, depend on timing sensitively enough uh, to, to be like this. The second thing we can do is to draw a line um, at uh, 15, or so uh, 15 or so milliseconds and reflect the data points that we had about this line. Uh, so when we do that shift and then reflect, uh, we get the green points, which seem to be um, in good agreement with the original date. So what does it mean to, uh, to do this uh, reflection? It means to reverse the roles of pre and post synaptic um, spikes because uh, this timing is uh, between pre and post. So if we shift it, if we reflect it, then uh, we reverse the roles. You may ask, why do we reflect around 15 milliseconds? The reason is that there is a certain delay associated with uh, the presynaptic transients. Um, so what we get from this agreement between the reflected and the original CTP curve is that um, we expect the pre and post decay time scales to be approximately equal and also the amplitudes to be approximately equal. And this is a consequence of the second uh, depression window that uh, Michael also mentioned. Uh, the, the third thing we can do, which is important for the nonlinearity, is to look at the dependence of um, the, the change in synaptic efficacy on the pairing frequency. So this experiment was done at 0 0.3 hertz at 3 millimolar. At 1.8 millimolar um, at low frequencies, there is depression, but when you increase the pairing frequency, the frequency at which this uh, pre-post pair is uh, repeated, this um, the depression is replaced with uh, potentiation around three or four hertz. Um, so if all the transients in our model were on the order of 20 milliseconds, we would expect nothing to happen at three hertz because um, all, the, all the transients with uh, decay time scale of 20 milliseconds would have uh, delay, would have decayed a long time ago. Uh, so from this data, we can deduce that there has to be a longer time scale um, in the model, but from the symmetry between pre and post, we know that this time scale cannot be associated with pre or post separately. So it has to be associated with um, with the product. Um, another piece of evidence supporting that is imaging that uh, Yanis did. So um, he imaged uh, synaptic uh, contacts. Uh, he did calcium imaging of synaptic contacts uh, for um, 
pre-post or uh, post-pre-stimulation. Uh, uh, and he saw that for both pre-post and post-pre, there is a decay which is much than uh, 20 or so milliseconds. So uh, this means that the, um, it, the relative timing of pre and post, there's a certain symmetry for um, the decay, um, the, the long uh, temporal decay of uh, the calcium signal um, for pre and post spikes. So this uh, motivates, again, the uh, multiplicative structure of the nonlinear term in, in our model. Okay, so um, this was kind of some hand waving to um, to explain how we built the model, but then of course we fit it numerically to the data. So uh, these are the results of the experiment and um, the results of the fitting. So each cross here is uh, one cell and I'm showing the STDP curve for a pair of pre and post synaptic spikes at three, 1.8 and 1.3 millimolar. So at, one, at three millimolar, uh, you've already seen this data. Um, there is depression, potentiation, and a second uh, depression window. At 1.8 uh, millimolar, there's only depression. And at 1.3 millimolar, uh, the SDP curve is noisy, which is something that we discuss in our paper. Um, but on average, there is no, um, there is no change. So uh, the, the purple line here is the best fitting uh, model, including the nonlinearity, and the shaded area is um, uh, the standard deviation from uh, a collection of models that are in the neighborhood of the best fitting model. So this shows that um, there is no, it, there doesn't seem to be any uh, overfitting here. Uh, to, to show more directly that there's no overfitting, we held out part of the data um, to 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 see whether this model can make accurate predictions. But from um, these two panels, the STDP curve at 1.8 and at 1.3 millimolar, we see that pairs of spikes in calcium concentrations that are seen in vivo, uh, these, do not lead to, um, these do not lead to LTP, which is uh, a very big difference to what uh, was reported before and what a lot of people are using in their network models. Um, so from an experimental point of view, um, LTP can be recovered for bursts. Uh, so this at 1.8 millimolar, uh, increasing the number of postsynaptic spikes from one to four leads to change of sign of plasticity from, um, from depression to potentiation. Interestingly, when you uh, reverse the order of one pre and three postsynaptic spikes or three postsynaptic spikes and one pre, Again, the, the sign of plasticity changes from potentiation to depression, which is similar to uh, what was seen with one pre and one post synaptic spike at high levels of calcium. Um, and similar things happen at 1.3 millimolar. And the second uh, way of recovering LTP is by increasing uh, the pairing frequency. So um, this again, you've seen in the previous slide, increasing at um, 1.8 or at 1.3 millimolar, the pairing frequency for a pre-post pair or for post-pre pair uh, changes the sign of plasticity and our model uh, captures that, um, our model captures that correctly. So our model gives a complete description for um, the plasticity rules that are seen for multiple uh, spike patterns and for multiple levels of the extracellular calcium. And so I should just stress that um, the model was fit only on the spike pair data at low frequencies. Uh, all this data here was uh, held out and um, the model still gives an accurate prediction uh, for this. So um, I would like to summarize, we showed that the STDP shape, magnitude, and sign depends on the extracellular calcium uh, very strongly. Um, we built a nonlinear calcium-based model, which accounts for the experiments, and, and we showed that the nonlinearity uh, with, uh, associated with a long time scale is important to capture um, uh, the plasticity data at multiple levels of the extracellular calcium. Uh, our, from a modeling point of view, I think that our work shows that 
we should think about incorporating plasticity rules that are calcium based into network models. I think that uh, Michael would also agree uh, with this um, with this sentiment. And from an experimental point of view, our work underscores the importance of uh, measuring plasticity in physiological conditions. And so all the uh, details of this is on the bar archive. I would like to, uh, before I take some questions, um, go back to this uh, uh, thought experiment of uh, visiting the pyramids and then some other landmarks. Um, so of course, understanding what are the implications of um, plasticity rule like this for a network model is for future work, but I uh, wanted to do a simple numerical experiment to, um, to, uh, to understand whether this is even going in the right direction. So what I did similar to uh, what Michael described is to have a Poisson spike train of the presynaptic, uh, of the presynaptic neuron and of the postsynaptic neuron. And I asked how high does the firing rate have to be such that the change of synaptic weight is 1%, 5%, and 10%. And importantly, I did this for uh, the nonlinear model uh, with a calcium level uh, set to 1.5 millimolar, which is kind of the uh, center of the physiological range. So what this plot shows is that if the presynaptic firing rate is, uh, is low, or the postsynaptic firing rate is low, meaning that there are uh, weak correlations between pre and postsynaptic um, activity, as we would expect uh, for, for noise, um, then the synapse is protected from change. You can, if the presynaptic firing rate is low, then even if the postsynaptic firing rate is very high, um, still the synapse will not change by much. And the reason for that is because uh, plasticity in the model that we fit to data relies heavily on uh, the nonlinear term, which here would be uh, very close to, to zero. Uh, so again, this is a cartoon. This is, this is not a cartoon. This is a very simple simulation. Um, I, uh, as Maurizio mentioned, I recently started my lab at uh, UCSD. And uh, one of the things that I'm going to be working on is to understand uh, what happens when you incorporate a nonlinear uh, plasticity rule like the one that we fit to data into uh, network models to understand more systematically um, uh, how uh, we are able to remember over long time scales. Um, so if you're interested, please uh, send me an email. So again, I apologize for uh, the technical difficulties and uh, I will take some questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Very nice talk. Uh, you can actually close the, the the infinite screen sharing, so we can see you by face. Okay, that's great. So um, we have a bunch of questions here. So um, let me read them. Mm. Yes. So. <clears throat> Eustace Virriolas is asking actually if uh, there is uh, an optimal bursting frequency at which uh, obtaining at which to obtain uh, optimal or maximum LTP. Um, bursting frequency. So in our model, um, so our model allows for kind of infinite. Uh, we, we did not model a saturation of the calcium. So if you drive the, the neuron um, with very, very high firing rates, then our model says that um, uh, potentiation. So we have, um, we have an upper bound and a lower bound on the synaptic weight, but calcium, the calcium transients are not bounded. So uh, so the answer is uh, no. So the, there will be, uh, it, the burst can be strong enough such that the synapse will saturate to the upper bound. Um, so stronger, maybe, even, maybe. Stronger, even stronger burst will again saturate. Yeah. So maybe um, just to, to shape a little bit better. Uh, so is there any specific rhythm or cortical rhythms like from alpha to gamma 
that could be relevant in shaping the peak of LTP in your model? Or what could you predict uh, the best? So, um, so this would, this would be um, dependent on the calcium uh, transients, the, the time scale of calcium transients, uh, the nonlinearity in our, in our model is um, decaying on around 100 milliseconds. So this means that if there's something on the range of 60 to 150 milliseconds, which is, uh, I guess, the theta rhythm, uh, then this would mean that the calcium transients are constantly above the depression or the potentiation threshold, which would lead to large changes of the synaptic wave which I guess is, is consistent with some uh, behavioral experiments or, or um, in vivo experiments showing that these are uh, the kind of patterns that uh, are, are active when um, uh, these cells in CA1 form place fields. So. Thank you. Um, I still see wait, we have found some more questions. Uh, meanwhile, I will ask uh, you a question. So you show us that low uh, extracellular calcium actually can uh, make LTP disappear. Uh, what about LTD? Did you explore just at the level of, uh, of uh, the model if we can get rid of LTD in some way by just the cellular calcium or by some means of nonlinearity inside the model? Um. So yeah, we, we thought about it. We, um, I guess uh, one way of answering that is uh, if you, the structure of our model, um, so, so in Michael's uh, plot of, of the different families of uh, plasticity curves that you can get, um, one example was um, depression and then potentiation. Um, the structure of, our model that we found that is consistent to with the hippocampal data does not allow um, depression potentiation without a second depression window. Uh, so a second depression window seems to be essential for um, at least in uh, these hippocampal synapses. Uh, so I don't think that without any pharmacology or something more, um, uh, uh, some other intervention, there would be a way to get rid of LTD. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, if uh, anyone has other questions, please address them now. Otherwise, uh, I will uh, call the session off for today. So, okay. So, thank you, Jonathan, again for your contribution. Yeah, and, sorry about uh, that. Uh, you are totally excused. I'm glad you were able to deliver and uh, I mean, I will talk to the guys at USC probably and then do something about this. But anyways, uh, well, I guess we'll see you tomorrow. And uh, everyone, thank you very much for uh, being audience today. Uh, tomorrow we'll start at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, we have actually a bunch of people from the other side of the world, Australia. And as today was mostly developing uh, data analysis and quantification and technology to quantify calcium signals, tomorrow um, the majority of the talks actually will uh, uh, be focusing on more modeling approaches. We have a terrific panel of speakers, and so I'll be very glad to welcome, along with the other organizers, Neil Sigman, that is uh, uh, with, uh, right now disappeared and uh, might uh, show up in a second. And thanks to Kyle, however, that is in Melbourne and is probably waking up for right now. Um, so uh, we are gonna welcome again for tomorrow and thank you very much for attending these sessions and uh, I hope you enjoyed it and see you tomorrow. <laughs>